Thank you. Um, my name is Roman Fenner. I'm a patient with hypermobile EDS, Chiari malformation, that's surgery for cranial cervical instability, intracranial hypertension, kind of the kind of the neurological gamut. So everything that Bobby Jones CSF does is very near and dear to me, and it's really exciting to just hear all the amazing things happening. And I would like to continue to talk about that kind of stuff and highlight um, current research um, discoveries for EDS and where the future is going. So really quickly, just a quick show of hands, everybody in the audience, how many of you or a loved one or someone you know very well has some kind of Ehlers-Danlos diagnosis? Yeah, pretty much everybody in the room. <laughs> all right, so anyway, this is the right audience. So we're all very familiar with this disorder in our life. I want to do a really quick history though on just like the background and how it's come to be known. 400 BC, the ancient Greek physician Hippocrates documented the first cases of patients with easy bruising, um, bleeding, joint laxity, and it didn't take until 1892 when a Russian dermatologist with the name I cannot pronounce and I'm not going to attempt pronouncing published a paper describing the syndrome again, but because of isolation because of the way that knowledge was distributed back then, the information didn't really reach Western Europe. So it was in 1901 when Dr. Edward Ehlers presented his findings in Denmark, and then again in 1908, Dr. Henry Alexander Danlos um, presented it again, and it was in 1936 when a British physician decided to name the condition after those two physicians. So one would think that almost 100 years later, we would have a lot of progress on this disease, right? Wrong. <laughs> So when we want to talk about the prevalence of this disorder, the NIH as of 2020 reports a combined prevalence of all Ehlers-Danlos subtypes to be at least 1 in 5,000. Hypermobile EDS, the most common, 5,000 to 20,000 people, and classical EDS, 1 in 20,000 to 40,000. But a 2019 study conducted in Wales um, took information from almost 30 years of medical, base, medical, medical database data and they found out that EDS and joint hypermobility syndrome kind of combined had a prevalence of at least one in 500. So considering the difficulties in obtaining diagnoses for these conditions, the different forms of presentations in males versus females, it was 70% females, 30% males in the, um, the European database. Um, and just the spectrum of severity, the way that people present with this condition, we can conclude that even a 1 in 500 diagnosis is likely inaccurate just because of all the drawbacks and setbacks of how we've been able to identify this disorder. And um, again, it's likely unrepresentative of hypermobile EDS, the most prevalent form. And this stems from a lack of dedicated genetic research and um, epidemiological research on this disorder, namely in the United States, but all across the world. So. There's a pretty large burden with this, right? So as patients, we know it's really hard to be diagnosed and heard, understood by our providers sometimes. It's difficult to receive comprehensive care. It's, um, you know, we travel all across the country just to see that one right person who can change our quality of life. So we, we kind of become experts in our own disease, which is unfortunate sometimes. We, we are our own advocates and we become advocates in our communities, like what we're doing here is really important. But um, at the end of the day, we're really difficult and complicated patients and our pathways to getting treatment, if we can get treatment, are very convoluted for many reasons, but again, it's due to a lack of substantial basic science research on this disease in the scientific and medical communities. So who's fighting to change this? And these are just a few relevant examples of in my personal experience that I've worked with. Obviously, Bobby Jones CSF, Dorothy gave a great explanation for all the amazing things that are happening, like the International Patient Registry and the Common Data Elements, the Think Tank meetings, research colloquia, where we get these amazing minds from across the world together to connect and share their knowledge and hopefully provide better outcomes for them and their colleagues in their career. Um, but the core of that also, you know, is it's great that physicians work together, but Physicians aren't really going to learn anything new unless basic science research in labs and universities is conducted. So there's a growing number of EDS researchers, again, talking about the different universities partnered. And one of those is at the Medical University of South Carolina in the Norris Lab, which is, yeah. <laughs> um, and so I'm sure plenty of you have heard that name. But um, they are the largest, as of now, the largest HEDS, hypermobile EDS genetic lab in the country with a patient database. The first day they opened up, I think they received 4,000 signups and became the largest HEDS database in the world. And I'm sure, you know, since the year plus that that's opened, there's even bigger. So 
What's really important is to talk about a noteworthy breakthrough. As you can see in this little screen grab from a news article last year, they did identify a potential candidate gene for hypermobile EDS. Um, Picture to the right, you can see Dr. Courtney Gensimer, who is credited with the discovery. You can see former Miss America Camille Schreier, who is very open about her EDS diagnosis and her advocacy. You can also see a familiar face in the back of there, but we'll get to that later. But anyway, so this finding is, was, was groundbreaking um, for you know, almost 100 years of you know, clinical diagnostics of this disease and the 13 plus subtypes having known genetic markers, hypermobile not having a marker, and it being a purely clinical diagnosis. And when people present differently, it's still a convoluted way to get treatment. So this discovery, though, is really only the beginning. Um, because of CRISPR-Cas9 editing, an animal model um, in mice has been created, so you can study the phenotypes of HEDS, and it's the first really detailed look at the origins of this disease and how the comorbidities manifest. And it's really cool because, I mean, this is straight from their website, but they acknowledge that, you know, HEDS likely involves multiple other genes, but they're investigating all the genetic causes and the bigger picture and how it affects mast cell activation syndrome or hormones, GI manifestations. It's all really promising because, you know, in addition to all the neurological manifestations that a lot of us have from this disorder, um, it's, it's a full body thing. So, you know, everything, everything just falls apart. And in the future, what's really exciting is they hope to have a multidisciplinary connected tissue clinic where you can come in and have personalized treatment and see all the right doctors, which is just something that is totally unheard of. It's amazing what's happening at that university, and I know there's a lot of other great work happening across the country, too, in other labs. So what does this mean, though? You know, we as a community, as a whole, are working toward a future where we understand the causes of hypermobile EDS, which is, just, again, very poorly understood, um, and is the root of all of our problems for a lot of us. Um, and this is a future where, again, life might not be centered around symptom management for once. We might be able to receive targeted medicinal off-the-shelf therapy at some point that can mitigate the effects of our disease, which is just amazing to think about because we're you know, constantly in the OR, constantly in PT, um, but they're, you know, they're molecular genetic issues that eventually could be fixed. So this will enable us to live fuller, more productive lives in whatever way you define that. But you know, this, this is a really, this is a big vision. And this is only one discovery with a lot of others that are happening in the world right now. But how does this, how does this whole future of a better outcome for patients like us, how is that going to be a reality? Well, again, through continued research and collaboration and the education of other scientists and medical professionals about that research when it comes out. Um, but that really isn't going to be successful without patient involvement and advocacy. We're the ones driving that. We're the ones, it's our voices, our stories. Like when we go to Capitol and talk to our representatives. It's our stories that motivate them to want to make that change. So we're really important parts of it, but again, like none of it could be done without expanding the bodies of researchers and medical practitioners across the country who actually want to take this on and study this, which um, is kind of a fun point. The Norris Lab is very instrumental in doing that because of their HEDS internship program. It's the second year they've done it, and they take on undergraduate and graduate medical students from across the country and train them. And, work on this, you know, this mutation. So real life example of this happening, shameless plug. I was a uh, part of the inaugural class of the internship program last summer, and we got to study how the candidate mutation um, is working in this mouse model, and we got to kind of select a project. And so I studied how cells and connective tissue stick or adhere um, to proteins like collagen and fibronectin. And we're trying to explain just exactly why connective tissue is so fragile and weak. And um, so I knew that you know, going in, pursuing medicine, I'm a recent college graduate, I'm applying to medical school right now, and I, I always know that that was my path to you know, make a difference in this community, but through that experience and through um, the tutelage and mentorship of people like Dr. Norris and Dr. Gensimer, I really came to understand that expanding knowledge through research was so vital to, to people who, who live with this disease and who want to treat it. It's such a core aspect, because uh, you see a problem, you see a hole, and you have to fill that hole. So, you know, because of that, in my academic career, I've continued researching therapeutics for EDS, continuing to educate and advocate for patients as myself, always getting the chance to talk about it in presentations. So, in the meantime, I've been able to go to Harvard at their National Collegiate Research Conference and talk about my research. And a lot of people had never heard of EDS before, shocker. So, a lot of people were interested, which was really cool. Um, 
again, just raising awareness in my college, in my undergrad, I've met like a handful of people just this year alone who were like, I have EDS too. Like I saw, and it's just like, you know, it makes, it, it showed me, okay, this, this disease is not as rare as people say. If I'm seeing people in my day day life who say, oh, I have this disease too, you know, it's just, um, we're, we're on the cusp of something interesting. But it's really cool because I've been able to go on and conduct independent research studies thanks to a really gracious, supportive professor back at my college who um, let me study carbohydrate-based drug therapies for wound healing because as constant surgical patients, we have horrible scarring, atrophic scarring, tearing, bleeding. And so um, I was able to investigate glycomimetic molecules and generate a drug that could you know, potentially increase, you know, and interact with um, integrin receptors in fibroblast cells. And it isn't published yet. It's probably going to take a couple semesters more of other people picking up my project, but the data was promising that it's, it's something to look into. So, um, you know, I've really throughout this experience learned that there's an importance in making your experience known, whether that's in your community, to your doctors, to your professors even. You never know what's going to come out of it. You never know who you're going to share knowledge with, who needs knowledge on that journey, or who you might inspire to, you know, take up a big project and start a huge research program somewhere. You never know. So where are we at this moment, just to kind of sum up? We now live in a world and a time where we are seeing rapid progress in a short window of time for patients like us. It's really hopeful. Knowledge of our condition is slowly but surely disseminating. It takes a lot of hard work, a lot of your hard work, but it's happening. And we're seeing people with this disorder entering science and medicine and advocacy policy, all these things with the intention to expand knowledge, improve patient outcomes, and create systemic change for this disorder that is seen and, and treated, I mean, across the board. And why do we do this though? It's because the network of knowledgeable physicians and surgeons is growing, but it's small in size and fragmented. We all know this. We all know all the plan and long car rides that we've had to take throughout our lives just to you know, have a surgery that gives us a chance at life. And EDS is, again, a lot more common than many think. Just like we were talking about how Chiari and Syringomyoia, which are related disorders to EDS, are at least three million people, at least. Um, countless people lack proper diagnoses. They walk around all day and never know exactly what they have. And they're barred from the chance of proper treatment and at the right life that they should be living there for. And because of that, we have a lot of variance in patient outcomes, even in those who are diagnosed with these conditions. Some receive full comprehensive care, living near normal lives, and others are fighting each day for survival, just a chance to you know, be able to step out of bed and make it to the grocery store or take care of their kids. And the differentiating factor is really just their access to care, if they have access to the right doctors and know where to go. So, you know, everybody's entitled to a chance at a productive, fulfilling life where their chronic illness doesn't dictate it for them. And it's a really sad reality that this has been the reality for most of us. So how do we keep this momentum? How do we ensure that things keep moving forward at an alarming rate? Well, this is our job. It really is. We have to maintain involvement in our communities. We have to spread awareness also, like telling your story. And again, like that's a common theme for this weekend is telling your story is so important for so many reasons. And to support and rely on the same people who are on your same journey. We're all in this together. And I mean, our perspectives are so vital. Even if we experience things on a different spectrum, our journey with your chronic illness is such a vital perspective no matter who you tell it to, because you never know whose mind it might change. So just a closing remark reflecting on ideas of wellness is that, you know, this disorder, something you really need to practice with it is, you know, you need to learn how to hope. You need to hope, you know, hope that there is light at the end of the tunnel somewhere and that things are going to someday get better if you keep fighting. And some of us have to fight harder to be able to visualize that hope because things seem quite hopeless at times. But it's important to remember that we all really, no matter where we are in our journey, are in this together. And that fighting battles each day really can make it hard to see that big picture. Um, especially when you, know, you see people around you getting better, but maybe you're not getting better yourself. But regardless, I mean, I think again, your story is valid and your voice has to be heard. And that our work, especially what we're doing here, and what other doctors and scientists, people are doing across the country, in whatever realm, whatever area of expertise, it's all for one common cause in making this future possible. So I just you know, thank you so much for giving me this opportunity to speak and to share these things. It's, um, yeah, wellness is a really important topic dealing with such a chronic disorder and staying hopeful about the future is an important part of it. So thank you.